cuatro objetivos. Four objectives to recover legality, get back to normal and coexistence, continue with the recovery of the economy and hold elections. To return to legality is to restore the validity of the Spanish Constitution and the statute of autonomy of Catalonia in Catalonia. The Spanish government has invoked special constitutional powers to suspend the regional government and force elections to counter an independence drive. With the central government ready to take over the running of Catalonia on Friday, what will be the consequences for the future of the region? If European foundational values are at risk in Catalonia, they will also be at risk in Europe. Over the past few years, the UK has voted for Brexit and the refugee crisis and terrorism have shocked Europe. Now, with the Catalan independence movement becoming an institutional challenge, how should the EU deal with the challenges of separatism? Other countries and regions, such as Scotland and Iraqi Kurdistan, have held referendums for independence. Why are calls for independence becoming more prevalent around the world? Having struggled for independence for three centuries, the regional government in the Spanish autonomous region of Catalonia launched yet another referendum on the topic on the first day of this month. The referendum was later declared illegal by Spain's central government. The wealthy region in northeast Spain is once again under the spotlight. The fate of Catalonia's independence is now still at stake. How will the situation end this time? What does this movement mean for Spain and the rest of Europe? And what are the new characteristics of political campaigns in the current era? To discuss those issues and more, I'm happy to be joined in the first part of the program by Anna Tangen. When we come back, hopefully we'll be joined by Fraser Cameron, a policy advisor from European Policy Center located in Brussels. But welcome to Dialogue, Anna. The Catalan leader, uh, Pujman, uh, at this moment, at exactly this moment, calls for a snap election to somehow make a compromise. Are you surprised? No, it, he really doesn't have many alternatives at this point. I mean, he's in a very difficult position. He pushed this referendum. I don't know what he was expecting. This is a, an area which is one of the richest in Spain, but also is one of the most in debt. It's, it's bond rating, it's junk. There's no way it could actually independently start uh, in a, uh, a separate republic. So it was very puzzling to know why he would be pushing at this point. I mean, there have been, this is not the only referendum that's been had. Over the a period of, of years, there have been multiple referendums, some in uh, 550 in small individual, individual cities, and in, four, in 2014. There seems to be this pattern. Uh, the, it all traces back to 2006 when there was this articles of, of um, autonomy that were created. Uh, unfortunately, what happened is that the Spanish Supreme Court intervened, and in 2010, they declared some parts of it, some parts of it, invalid. And this enraged uh, local sentiment and has led to the situation that we find ourselves in today. Prime, Prime Minister Rajoy called for an election. What are the, the differences and the similarities, if any, between the two appeals? Okay. All right. Let's keep it very, very clear. What uh, Pujamon is calling for, Pujamon is calling for, is snap elections under the existing autonomous region. Mm -hmm. right? And what Ro Ro Rajoy is saying is, look, uh, we're invoking Article 155 of the Constitution, and we're basically dissolving uh, the existing government. We will call for new elections. Now, no one knows what those elections would yield. All right? So each side has some, um, let us say, some uh, <laughs> uncertainty about what the future is. But... Uh, Puigdemont is in a very difficult position. He, quote, got what he wanted. He thought this would lead to negotiations of some sort. The Spanish government has taken a very hard line. They do not want any kind of talk of this nonsense. You know, obviously, they've had issues in the past with the Basques, and they are not in a position to see their country dissolve into separate little states, each one thinking that the simple answer is simply is to be by yourself. What happened on October the 1st uh, when the referendum was held in Catalonia was only 43% uh, um, 
-hmm. turnout. The turnout was very low, uh, although 90% of those who cast their votes uh, supported the independence. However, what if uh, a snap election is to take place, so what would be the most likely results given the previous low turnout? Well, uh, most people think that uh, it won't really change that much and that the existing parties will be there, but there might be a shakeup. Obviously, Pujamont has other rivals. He's, he is not the head of a uh, uniform group. There are many different parties who are pushing this from many different angles. He's caught between the moderates who are saying, slow down, we're losing businesses. All right, this is not going to work out. We don't have a plan. This is like Brexit. We're jumping off a cliff with no idea where the bottom is. And the extremists who say, seize independence at any cost. The voters have spoken. It's time to take action. Uh, but there's no way to take action because there's nowhere, n nowhere to go. Do you foresee the current crisis to degenerate into an armed conflict? Well, this is one of the, one of the issues. Uh, what, what happened in Catalan is that the police department has basically become under the municipalities. So they're actually under control of the local governments, not the state. And this could, in theory, invoke some sort of things. Now, they said just recently, a couple of days ago, that the police will be loyal to them and they can block any attempts by the Spanish government to do that. That could lead to bloodshed or standoffs or very, very serious situations. The real danger, though, is not, you know, the, obviously the army can move in and they can do things, but you don't want that because you could have radicalization. You could have groups within there taking the same uh, course as the Basque separatists and starting to engage in terrorist activities in order to push their point. Bloodshed is the last thing uh, all parties uh, in, uh, involved in the game want to see. But uh, uh, Prime Minister Rajoy has vowed to take back uh, media and the police. Uh, will that run into conflict with the local media and uh, I mean those who support the independence uh, will do whatever they can to resist uh, intervention from the central government this is the point you're having people vote emotionally on very very complex issues you saw the same thing in Brexit they were showing uh, pictures of uh, migrants who were coming in and they were using these mm -hmm. to threaten people and this is the same thing that happened here the Washington Post did a very uh, interesting article on both sides there was tremendous amounts of fake news that were floating around who is doing it it's not clear uh, some allegations were that it was Russia, some said it was uh, radical uh, groups on both sides who were trying to uh, fearmonger people into voting one way or the next. But it, what's clear is that there's, everybody uh, is susceptible now to the social media and what that can create in terms of false expectations about very complex issues. And the, you're, you've seen this many times again. Donald Trump uh, benefited from this. He used a very, very sophisticated group called Cambridge Analytica, who was able to tap into big data as they w themselves boasted. They had over 4,500 data points on 220 million people, which gave them the abil ability to gauge exactly what their fears were and how they would vote given uh, issues being presented to them. Very, very powerful weapon, and it seems that this is going to be the future. Um, why do you think? Uh, oh, let, 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 let's, let me give you one follow-up question on the use of social media. Uh, there, there have been so many fake news stories on both sides. Uh, what do you think of the uh, impact of uh, the negative impact of uh, social media, the fake news? Well, I, I think it's it's uh, actually a threat to what we perceive as, as democracy. Democracy depends on having factual basis to make rational decisions. If people are fanning fires of emotion with fake news, how are people going to... In the United States, we have a large group of people who do not believe that the press can tell the truth. So they, quote, search for alternative facts which they choose to believe because it supports their feelings on this, which have been, of course, fanned by uh, kind of ideas put forth by these people who are trying to lead them away. It's kind of, think of the old tale of the, uh, uh, the guy who uh, sang, all <laughs> sang to the rats and got them to leave, and then he took the children with them when they didn't pay. This is the kind of thing that is a real danger, not only in democratic uh, countries, but everywhere. You know, this is a very dangerous situation uh, that uh, 
uh, takes me back to what happened uh, in Urumqi, capital city of Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region, on July the 5th. Um, a rioting uh, there uh, killed so many innocent people, and it was all attributed to the release of a fake video clip uh, that uh, highlighted the alleged brutality of uh, torture and abuse of. Uh, whatever in the, uh, against uh, uh, Uyghurs, that was said to be the rumor and the fake news. So don't you think this kind of fake news uh, is likely to ignite an explosion of social anger and that will seriously derail the social stability? So as a result, what do you think of uh, the legitimacy of imposing censorship on the social media? Because, you know, in democracy, uh, you have always uh, the uh, factor of uh, you know majority tyranny. Uh, not everything about democracy can be reliable. Um, sometimes it's, it's truth in the hands of the minority that really counts, not uh, the so-called uh, principle of majority. Uh, whereas the majority, uh, who can be a majority tyranny, uh, would uh, abuse the use of the social media. That would give rise to a very explosive situation. Well, it's uh, like the nuclear bomb, social media and technology is a two-edged sword. And each country has to figure out how they're going to deal, deal with it. I mean, the days of the idea that, um, you know, the Internet would be this free-flowing highway across uh, the entire world, unregulated, uh, no need to do anything, have passed. Uh, sovereign Internet seems to be uh, the status quo. Each country believes that anything emanating from its country, anything coming into its country, needs to be checked. We've already seen allegations of boat tampering uh, leveled against Russia by the U.S. Uh, we've heard of other instances there, and then there's the active use of these kind of mechanisms like Cambridge Analytica. You know, with those kinds of powerful weapons, should you know, a few people be able to manipulate large masses into making very, very complex decisions based on simple uh, emotions? And I, agree, I don't think they should. So, yes, there is a balance point, and each country has to arrive at what that is. Do you think a parallel comparison sounds a little bit far-fetched between the independence of Kosovo and this referendum that calls for independence of uh, Catalonia in Spain? Well, there, uh, I, I, the, I think the Russian position is that uh, the EU is speaking um, uh, inconsistently about this. Uh, I don't necessarily see them as the same. We're talking about uh, an armed conflict. You had active abuses going on. We're talking about Catalonia. This is one of the tourist capitals of the world. You go to Barcelona, everyone goes there. This is not a country that is under the heel of some dominant uh, power that is grinding them into the ground or anything like this. This has nothing to do with the Rohingya, anything like that. If you want to compare it to something, it would be more like Scottish nationalism, except Scotland has a legal basis. They go about this having legal referendums. This is not. This is just a group of people saying, hey, let's have a vote and see how people feel. But there's no basis in the Constitution. It wasn't the government that declared this illegal. It was Spain's Supreme Court. If you're going to have laws <laughs> to keep a country together, they must uh, be obeyed. Otherwise, what do you have? Complete chaos, people making up their mind, and now, increasingly, on uh, fake news, social media hype, this is not the way that you can run a country or a society. What message do you think uh, this, referendum, uh, this referendum in uh, Catalonia would send to Scotland? People there in Scotland uh, are planning yet another referendum to decide their future. Well, they're, they're, they're unhappy about what, uh, the Brexit deal, and that, that, that's, not, that's the triggering mechanism where people are saying we need to revisit it. The number of people who, in Scotland who voted, voted overwhelmingly to stay in. They need the EU, their subsidies, their relationships, and their trade. So they look at this as we as a country did not approve of this. Uh, or as an area, and now we're being dragged into it, now we need to rethink that. But I don't think drawing parallels between a legal all right, referendum process that is uh, according to law and an illegal one that was ginned up by people who believe that they can excite people, gain power, without actually having an exit strategy. It doesn't come as a surprise that we have the strong backing from the European Union 
to support the decision of the central government in Spain in rejecting the referendum and the results of, of uh, the referendum in Catalonia. Is it because uh, politicians in Brussels uh, foresee the possible disintegration of the European Union? You look at uh, Brexit, referendum in Scotland, although it culminated with a uh, May answer about the future. Um, and then uh, Catalonia, and I believe there are also potentially other flashpoints calling for secession or independence one way or another. So, what do you think of the dynamics uh, in the uh, secession movement across the whole continental Europe? Well, I don't think it's just Europe. I mean, we can be looking around right, the world uh, at the Kurds. Kurds uh, within Europe, you have the situation that's going on in Lombardy. And in China, you know, Taiwan, Tibet, uh, Xinjiang Uyghur autonomous but region. The, but there's, Yang Rei, let us draw a very sharp red line between what is legal and what is illegal, mm -hmm. okay? If, you know, you, you cannot, you should not be able to persecute a, a group of people and kick them out of the country if they have a legal uh, basis to be there. Uh, those are very, very different circumstances. What you have in Spain is very simply a group of people declaring on their own without any legal basis that they're unhappy. Now, the basis of the vote uh, at 92% uh, uh, voted in, for, in favor of it. Did that 92% actually understand all the implications of what they were putting into motion? Did the people who supposedly represent and ask them to consider this explain this? No. They thought it was a simplistic solution that somehow it would all work out better. And this kind of simplistic thinking is what is the root cause of this kind of separatism, which is running amok around the world. It seems in the wake of the Cold War, ethnic groups are calling for independence across the whole uh, world. And some of them went to extremes, such as the sectarian violence, that uh, plagues the Middle East. Mm -hmm. Ethnicity, religious extremism, characterize uh, some of the violence uh, that uh, besets uh, volatile regions such as in the Middle East. Do you think the bipolar world imposed by the former Soviet Union and the United States at the height of the Cold War could actually uh, uh, serve to stabilize the situation? But uh, with the uh, relaxation of such a bipolarized world order in the Cold War. Uh, what has been nipped in the bud in terms of ethnicity and religious extremism suddenly found its way uh, in some of the testing ground, in some of the volatile regions. And therefore, we, we are facing a crossroad, the intersection at this moment, where you see more of such pro-secession movements? Well, uh, l let's go back to the basics. The reason that we have these pro a lot of these problems, if you're talking about the Middle East and other areas, was because of colonialism, going back to this idea that when the divisions were made and these countries were created, they were done so so that a minority um, you know, of one religious or ethnic would be in control of a majority uh, of a different ethnic or religious majority, therefore making them dependent on their former host countries, or I shouldn't say host, colonial powers. So this was a very deliberate act at that time. It was a very, as they say, Xiao Song Ming, uh, mm -hmm. very, very <laughs> little clever because it, it's left us in the situation. Yes, the Cold War put a lid on it, but it was still boiling beneath that, and this is the difficulty. In the U.S., we supported people that, um, dictators, people that we did not believe in, who did not believe in the tenets of, of, the, th of the ideals that we say we believe in. We kept them there because they were brutal enough to keep the situation under control. But that has its price to pay, and th that is what we're ter seeming to reap right now. Years and years of repression under these people color revolution without any idea of how this was going to turn out, being encouraged by uh, the U.S. and other powers, thinking that it would all be, be rosy. It hasn't been rosy. Perhaps uh, what we're talking about is part of a populism that is sweeping both sides of the Atlantic Ocean. Let me go to Mr. Larry Levine, CEO and the founder of uh, ESDOCU. Hello. Hello. Ni hao. Uh, ni hao. Uh, Larry. Sunny afternoon in Madrid. 
Hi, this is Evening in Beijing. But uh, can you brief us on the latest development in Catalonia where uh, Mr. Puigdemont, the leader, calls for a snap election? What does that mean? Well, as you very well know, we are living in this very moment a surprising, in some way, unexpected twist in the political situation in Catalonia. Uh, President of Catalonia is calling for elections, and the meaning is a big leap, not forward, but backward. Uh, backward to the rule of law, because they are calling for elections under the provisions of the Catalonian Estatute and the Spanish Constitution. So this is good news. Uh, I don't know because it is happening in this very moment, but uh, and, and most probably, and every indication from the uh, political sources and press sources are telling that he's going to announce, as you say, a call for elections. And I insist, the meaning is a big jump backward to the rule of law, which is good news. Um, sounds like a tongue twister, but anyway, um do you think in this way uh, Mr. Poitman will compromise a decision by Madrid to use Article 155 uh, in the effort to replace the autonomy of Catalonia? Well, if uh, a call of elections means that every proposal, political proposal, has to be submitted through the campaign in any different political party. So we need to wait to the outcome of that new elections. And uh, when we're talking about the Catalanes, the Catalonian people, uh, we must say that uh, in Catalonia they have voted in the last five years six times, European elections, national elections, regional elections, I'm talking about legal elections. And in these five, uh, these six moments, the majority of votes, the majority of the population in Catalonia has voted not for independent movements. And this is something which is very important to state, that uh, the core of the discussion in the last two months is that the minority never can impose to the majority of population. So answering to your question, we need to wait for the outcome of the new elections. Thank you so much, uh, Levin, uh, for being with us and for briefing us on the latest in Catalonia. We'll be back in a short while. Stay with us, please. Welcome back. As we have expected, uh, we are very happy and blessed by the first-hand account uh, from Fraser Cameron, director of the EU Asia Center located in Brussels. Welcome to our the last part of the discussion here, bad traffic condition in Beijing. Uh, but anyway, we are very really, uh, quite relieved. To, what can you tell us about the latest there? Um, the snap election called for by um, Pujman and uh, Article 155. Uh, what would be the worst case scenario? The worst case scenario would be violence in Catalonia, but I don't think that will happen. I think the politicians on both sides realize they've come to the edge of the cliff and they have to step back now. Elections will perhaps give each side some breathing space. I don't think uh, Rajoy will be rushing to introduce Article 155. Both sides need to take a deep breath and realize that Spain with Catalonia as part of Spain is much more important for both entities than going for separation. And I think cool heads will prevail. I think there's been emotion after the in initial referendum in Catalonia. Now I think we need some time to calm down and realize that unity is actually the best solution. Is it because of the strong backing from the European Union uh, to support the central government in Madrid that uh, those who didn't participate in the referendum, after all the turnout was only 43, uh, will eventually say enough is enough, let's go back to normal um, and therefore uh, this uh, ridiculous scenario would uh, uh, return to normal. That is certainly the hope. The EU has to be careful not to be seen to be siding too closely with one government. They want the Spaniards to actually solve this problem themselves. The 
EU Commission is very careful not to interfere in the internal affairs of any member state. That's why, for example, they did not campaign or make any comment during the Brexit referendum, where you had actually a very similar turnout, almost a similar result. So I think referendum are inherently dangerous. The EU knows this. We have a lot of experience in the last few years. Now we have to try and ensure that we get back to the system of representative government, which is by far the best system for Europe. Do you think uh, the referendum on October the 1st uh, uh, was actually a practice of brinksmanship on the side of Catalonian uh, independence leaders in the hope of uh, uh, ringing some concessions from Madrid uh, so that they would enjoy much more autonomy? Yeah, exactly. I think this is what they wanted to do to demonstrate by getting people out into the streets also going to vote in an illegal referendum that they actually wanted first more autonomy that this would inevitably lead to independence so I think that was their card now I think when people have seen how difficult this is going to be I think we'll see a slight retreat from these positions what do you think of the spillovers coming out of this referendum uh, for the rest of the uh, uh, Europe for example your homeland uh, Scotland well, Scotland, the referendum was lost 55-45 three years ago. It's now been parked until after the Brexit uh, negotiations. So at the moment, that's calm. But if, for some reason, there were to be a split in Spain, it would immediately reignite demands for separation in Flanders, um, perhaps in other regions in Europe, as well as Scotland. And perhaps, perhaps in Northern Ireland. In Northern Ireland, too. And I think, you know, there's a, the way the demographics are going in Northern Ireland, there's a reason to believe that within the next 10 to 20 years, there could actually be a majority in favor of unification with Ireland. Are you in general? There's, there's, there's an argument to say that the EU should be um, actually becoming more forceful than saying, listen, Instead of having all of these separate things, what we will do is create uh, a situation where we have a stronger Europe and each segment of it can be part of the e EU uh, common market and we don't have to get embroiled in all this who's doing what where. Are you optimistic about the future of the European Union? Yes, it will be a more flexible Europe. There's no question about that. I think we'll see once Merkel gets a new team in office in the next month or so, we'll see the revival of the Franco-German tandem. Macron's got some very interesting ideas. And I think you're right. We need to have a Europe that actually meets the aspirations of all the regions of Europe as well as the nation states. Do you think with the end of the election year in Europe, we have more reasons to feel optimistic about the future of uh, continental Europe in terms of uh, the integration of the territory? And, uh, so do you think... Uh, it depends year, on the economy. The economy is doing well at last in Europe, and so that's good. I think employment is coming down, growth is increasing, and I think there's a general realization that we went to the brink almost by possibly electing Marine Le Pen in France. And Thank you so France. much. With that, we come to the end of this edition of Dialogue on the future of Catalonia and perhaps the future of the European Union. I'll see you next time. Goodbye.